Hi, everyone, and welcome to our The Inclusion Journey podcast. Today, we are being um, uh, graced by a very special guest who I met in London in May. It's a very special interview today because Bola Adesina is a very busy lady. So Bola Adesina, um, I've met her in the UK, but she will be providing more of her introduction later on. Uh, she will be giving us insights on the topic of the transformative power of embracing new cultures and perspectives. Just to do some a bit of an introduction, Bola is a multi-awarded diversity, equity, and inclusion advisor and well-sought-out speaker. She received the Rising Stars Award in 2022, and she's known for her work in integrating digital and cultural transformation. She's based in London, UK, and I, again, I had the privilege to sit beside her on a panel discussion at the recently held AIMS Multicultural Event in London, United Kingdom. Welcome, Bola. Uh, thank you, Maria. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. So, Bola, to start with, could you please share with us your personal journey and experience in the field of diversity, equity, and inclusion? I know when we were chatting, um, you know, during our um, event, you mentioned that, you know, it was that you were in a different field, but you got into the DEI field. So what led you to this work and what inspired you to become a DEI leader? So maybe just fast track on your career journey and how uh, it led you into this particular work that you do. Uh, and, and thank you. And that's a great question, uh, Maria. I know you've done uh, a bit of an introduction. So my background is uh, technology, I'm a technologist. Um, but as well as um, worked in HR, um, as global the uh, partner uh, for Elgin, and, and then future of work uh, for LNG, actually looking at uh, bringing an integrated workplace management system um, for enhanced um, employee experience. And, uh, but DEI is close to my heart, is, is something that I've been doing for years. And I, I think it dates back to many years ago, I think initially uh, gender diversity, because obviously I'm a, as a woman in technology, there's not many of us um, around. Um, and I, I worked at UBS um, uh, Investment Bank um, for a few years. And before that, I worked in Aviva um, in very technical roles. Um, and then I joined LGM as well um, as a middleware expert um, before uh, cloud technology. And there weren't a lot of women um, within um, tech at the time. Um, so we set up a Women in Technology Forum, which was C-suite led. And I had some ideas because I knew what the challenges and I've been spoken to uh, other women in IT at the time. Um, so the interest around diversity actually grew from there. So from gender, I started asking the question around ethnicity. And I was asked whether I wanted to set up something uh, within the organization uh, with a, a, a chap called Justin, who was within the business um, at the time. I was really driving for diversity on the investment floor at the same time. Um, so created Culture Club um, within the company. And, and to your question, what inspired me? So for me, I used the uh, talk, uh, especially around the industry at the time, around gender diversity and the the traction that was gaining at the time. And then I felt, I started talking about asking the question around the ethnicity, um, and then we started doing something about it, because basically just said, okay, do you you have the ideas? Do you want to set something up? And then we set up an ethnicity work stream as a result. Um, and I think a, a, another reason is a family one, um, because I looked at my kids at the time, and I thought, I don't want them years down the line looking me in the eye when I'm old and asking me, mom, what did you do for our generation? Um, I, at least now they can go on LinkedIn on social media and see all the great work, right? Um, I'm doing with others to drive a lot of the changes that we're driving, not just within the organization, but um, the industry as well, and consequently society. Um, so my drive, so those are my drivers really, the, the fact that the future generation, I want to leave something for them as part of that ESG thing, uh, sustainability, um, and also just to change society and change people's views and perceptions on um, different people or people from marginalized groups. Yeah. And, you know, uh, those are great uh, 
I think purpose, the, the main purpose of you doing this work really transform into a more higher purpose, which is more on your legacy. I like yeah. that. I like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I can share that as well. Maybe because, you know, we, we are, you know, women of color, we have similar struggles and challenges that led us to this kind of work. So did you do uh, more of, a, so did you add more to your education when it comes to DEI or it's just really based on live experiences, uh, experiences in tech, HR? So, or do you have additional, uh, you mentioned something about gender uh, diversity. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I did it. So um, obviously I started with uh, gender diversity. Uh, there's an uh, initiative called the Diversity Project, mm -hmm. which uh, looks at uh, diversity across the board, not just gender is expanded, but it, it started with gender um, in, in our industry, asset management and pensions and savings. And it's grown into a big, massive thing, right? And I started volunteering on that and learning through education and, and so on and so forth. And this was at a, as, as, as a time when I was studying for my MBA at Warwick. Um, mm -hmm. So there was a lot of learning from the MBA around organizational behavior, around uh, leadership, and the art of judgment and, and strategy and practice and, and so on and so forth. So I had board governance as well. So I sat on a board of a charity, UK charity at the time. So I was able to kind of like bridge that gap and almost learn firsthand the impact that organizations and firms can have on society. Uh, and for me, using those learnings and those insights, I'm just, I think naturally, I'm just inclusive anyway, but working with other people that had the passion um, internally within the firm actually grew me as a person. And having um, the support of, of C-suite at the time uh, was really important as well. So yes, a lot of research, a lot of um, insights gleaned, a lot of workshops, a lot of um, uh, surveys uh, completed and just seeing the feedback, seeing the findings and just picking out you know, salient points that we could maybe try within the organization as well, uh, which has worked really well um for us that's that's great to know and um because if if nobody will believe in you to um implement what you've learned i don't think whatever education you receive will not be of value uh absolutely I, 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 yeah i appreciate the the fact that you had a very supportive um c-suite leaders because i think that's very important part of the equation when it comes to dei the support of the leaders. Yeah. And so uh, can you share, so going back to our topic on the uh, transformation by embracing new cultures and perspectives, as, as we all know, UK, the UK is also a very multicultural, diverse country now. So can you share with us some specific examples or success stories of organizations that you work with uh, that have undergone transformation just by embracing new cultures and perspectives? Yeah, um, again, a, a very good question. Um, and, and obviously, what would I uh, company to use as a case study and that the company that I work for? Um, so Elgin, um, as you know, uh, is the investment arm of LNG, which is Legal and General, which is a UK, um, a predominantly UK company, although Elgin has expanded into other you know, geographical um, areas globally. Uh, what is UK led is UK run, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so has traditional UK values uh, within the company. And going back to 2017, 2018, um, was it a diverse company? Yes, but was it, uh, were some ethnicities underrepresented? Absolutely. Uh, were women underrepresented? Absolutely. There's still more that we can do, right? Even to today. And so it was a very good test bed for diversity and inclusion and, and how to promote it and how to make things work. And I actually saw it firsthand how when the C-suites are bought in and when the organization itself, and by the organization, I mean from the top, right, is engaged and actually want change, then that change will happen. And that was, and I was fortunate, very fortunate to be in a company 
where I've experienced that. And that was what happened back in 2018. Um, I mean, at the time when we I set up the ethnicity work stream, it was, we were looking at underrepresentation, right? Mainly then. And I kid you not, within, we saw the data and within 18 months, you know, you saw visible representation, greater, right? like more uh, people on the floors. Uh, and for me, that shows you the power of data as well, because what you can't measure, you're not really going to do, people would not really do it um, until it's measured. And the fact that there's data behind it to actually show that, look, these are the areas, these are the points, these are what we need to do and, and so on and so forth. And we didn't just look at, you know, just ethnicity as its entirety, like people would do back then, like they used the word, we are going in Bay. We actually went through and looked at, okay, Black, Asian, um, Eastern, Southeast Asian, and all the ethnicities, the main ethnicities represented within the company. Uh, mixed heritage as well, uh, we looked at. And uh, because we wanted to do it right, right? We wanted to actually look at actually, so what should we be aiming for? Should we be aiming for uh, a percentage of UK population uh, or should we be, what exactly do we need to do? But more of it really is around, can we foster an environment where we can have multicultural exchanges? Can we foster those dialogues? And that's what we started doing. Um, so as well as looking at the data and looking at, you know, what stories we can tell and the why behind the data, we we're actually holding events where we talk about different cultures. So we look at the calendar of events, uh, Lunar New Year is quite usually very early on in the year. So usually it's our first and St. Andrews, I think, um, um, in, in very early on in the year. And we would celebrate stuff. So we would go, for example, to our East and Southeast Asian colleagues. And so look, this date is coming up. What would you like to, what would you like to celebrate? Would you like to volunteer? And then we set up a working group and then we discuss it. And then we, we, we the format and everything, what is gonna happen on the day and so on and so forth. And we've done that successfully. Um, but the one thing that really enabled that is actually we have a budget. So every single employee resource group has a budget behind it, and so does Culture Club. Otherwise, you can't do anything, right? Because when yeah. we do this, we provide food, we have to provide drinks, because when you're talking about multiculturalism, those stories, you can tell them effectively through heritage, through food, through colleague stories, right? And so on and so forth. So that, that's what's happened. Um, the drivers for me, C-suite being bought in, and then engage and galvanize grassroots that were so um, happy that they're being seen, their voices are being heard and wanting to do something as well uh, as a result. And of course, uh, the tragic death of George Floyd galvanized, you know, and I was a catalyst um, for a lot of the follow-on effects. So we started doing diversity and inclusion back in 2017 anyway, mm -hmm. but it kind of like sped things up. And it actually what it did was it gave us a way of forum to actually have candid conversations. So for the first time in our organization, we had a conversation about race. Let's talk about race. Uh, I remember 2017, 2018, no one wanted to talk about race. No one, it, it was almost like a word that people didn't want to talk about. Or it's a taboo, taboo subject, Absolutely. yeah. Mm -hmm. But roll forward now, people are talking about it. People will mention the word ethnicity and, and so on and so forth. So a lot has changed and uh, within the company and it's become, the, the cultural transformation has been phenomenal. It's feedback that we get all of the time and, and thanks to the community. Uh, that I formed behind that to be able to push through that year on year. Um, yeah, and made it an inclusive workplace that it is today. And what's the impact on uh, retention? Did, did you also monitor the retention rate between or while uh, doing this uh, initiatives or while doing this kind of work? Uh, very good question. Again, that's data, right? Um, mm -hmm. As we there's always been a struggle, a challenge with data, and it's not just us, it's everywhere else. Uh, but one of the pillars of Culture Club 
in terms of the goals, in terms of um, the, the strategy is actually retention. So it's how do we attract diverse talent? How do we develop diverse talent while they're here? And how do we retain them so that they don't leave? And that retention piece is around the stuff that we do around celebrating cultures, hearing um, stories, storytelling, through storytelling, um, history, um, values, and, and so on and so forth. And even getting our allies involved because you have people who are married to other cultures, right? Mm -hmm. I, I remember we had a, an event and a chap um, came to me, a, a white colleague, and he said, actually, I'm here because I'm worried for the future of my child who is mixed, of mixed heritage. And what do I need to do uh, to ensure that, you know, things are not difficult for them and, and, and so on and so forth. So we have those conversations. We've had, let's talk about mixed identity. And it was the first in, in our company to actually have a panel of mixed heritage colleagues talk about their experiences. Because sometimes when we're talking about ethnicity and diversity and inclusion, we tend to forget uh, people who have mixed heritages, right? And is how do you give a voice and, and spotlight on people? And that what that has meant is by giving a voice to the different ethnic minorities and giving them their space, psychologically safe space, it definitely is definitely a retention tool. It's definitely mm -hmm. meant people tend to hang around because now, not just in terms of having conversations around culture and exchanges and, and so on and so forth, obviously having a greater sense of belonging. So we, we get the, that feedback, but also it gives them role models to aspire to. Because if they see someone running a business function for the first time that they didn't know of, that is of the same ethnicity, of the same gender, people are more likely to say, oh, I can see myself there in five years time, right? And speak to that person, have coffee with that person, and share, you know, ask about their journey and their experiences so that they can get to where they get to, right? So their inspiration, their role. So role modeling is a very big part of what we do. And yes, um, the data speaks for itself, I would say, yeah. That's great news. And, you know, this is a testament to, again, the power of data or, or data. So so I just wanted to backtrack. So Elgin is, a, how big is the company? What it's the number of employees, uh, basically, uh, the, the main company that you work with. Because the reason for the question is, how did you actually uh, roll it out? Did, did you do it in phases? Because I'm thinking it's a, it's quite a huge company with a significant number of employees. So it's also a struggle for companies to roll out or implement any initiatives related to this kind of um, a topic, DEI. Mm, yeah, that's a good question. So LGM itself is around uh, 2,400, 2,500. Yeah. Uh, because it's a business division, a federated business. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the group um, maybe around 10,000, 11,000. And we, so back, going back to 2017, I think what we did was we replicated what the diversity projects within the industry have done. So what they've done is they've had kind of had these strands of diversity. So gender, LGBT, ethnicity, socioeconomic mobility, family and carers, disability, neurodiversity, and um, something else which will come to me, and what we and health and well-being. And so for each of those, there's a member of C-suite who's the exec sponsor. So it's ultimately accountable, right, for the success of the work stream. And then you have the coaches who are running the work streams. And then for example, with Culture Club, We've got the three main strands. So how we attract talent, which is for early careers and, and, and so on and so forth. And then how we develop people in terms of mentoring, sponsorships, uh, looking at the data in terms of promotion and so on and so forth. And how we retain people around the stuff that we do in terms of culture, in terms of um, spotlighting people, giving them a platform um, to actually shine, right? Because sometimes visibility is key and that is sometimes that's what's missing, right? So we do all of that. And I think um, a lot of the, the, the strategy around that and making sure that 
huge thing. So it started out as a small thing, but it's become a huge thing over the years, right? And it's really expanded. And you have a lot of grassroots um, people actually volunteering for each of those employee resource groups. And the way we've been able to do that on mass is the CEO saying, every single person in this company, including myself, has to have a DNI objective. Oh. So when you have a DNI objective, you have to fulfill that objective. So in your mid year, you have to say what you're doing to meet that objective. And towards the end of the year, you get measured, right? So what are you doing? Are you volunteering? Are you volunteering to uh, speak to students? Or are you doing something charitable externally? Uh, what are you doing within the business itself in terms of DNI? So when you look at marketing, brand, and, and so on and so forth, are you actually doing that your day to day through an inclusive inclusion lens, right? Mm -hmm. Considering all of the ethnicities and a global view of things. So there's 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 so many ways, and it's been really impactful in that sense. So yeah, it's just a simple way of uh, you saying to us that that's how you embed DEI uh, in terms mm -hmm. of the day-to-day -day lives of the people. And it also entails accountability, right? So you mentioned at the end of the year, now mm -hmm. my supervisor is going to be asking me, what did you do in terms of you know the subjective related to DEI? That's very good. That's a very good example. Thank you for sharing that. Now, um, I'm sure you have encountered a lot of organizations too who are, you know, I, I know you're very busy in terms of speaking. Uh, mm -hmm. You've been meeting some orga organizations who are struggling as well in terms of how they move forward with their diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Um, mm -hmm. Based on your experience, what are the common obstacles or um, obstacles that lead to challenges that organizations mm -hmm. face when it comes to really uh, moving forward with uh, DEI work? Yeah. Um, uh, yes. I so through my work and and through obviously people, a lot of people know about me on LinkedIn and they will reach out um for help. Um, and, and apart from that, I actually offer uh best practice. So I created a network of um because I was getting a lot of requests and um, for help. Um, so people who are being made. Um, for example, coaches of um, work streams, for example, ethnicity going, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. What do I need to do? How do I need to make sure this is effective? And, and so on and so forth. And having a lot of phone calls. And I thought maybe I should, you know, group these people together and, you know, start doing stuff with them. But then again, I've been able to do that as well through um, certain networks. Um, like there's the Black Women in Asset Management um. Uh, network um, that actually has a lot of black women in it, lawyers and you know, um, in asset managers and, and and so on and so forth. And what we actually do is look for a way that we can make impact, right? Some of the companies, when they reach out to me, I remember a company that was, uh, I think, Chinese owned, UK led. Uh, a digital agency um, in the UK and I think it was around the Judge Floyd thing and someone reached out to me and said look we need help and so I, I went along and I said okay so what exactly do you need and I'm like you don't really know much about this how do we start how can we but of course because we've had years of experience of BNI I was able to advise and able to impact and there was a company where they didn't even know where to start to begin with. And by the end of it, by the end of the year, it was formal. They had they had a formal DNI forum. They had people who owned um their own objectives and priorities. And they were able to link those to their business strategy. Because otherwise, if you don't do that, then it doesn't make any sense to anyone, especially C-suite. And then they had a dedicated sponsor. Who was at the meeting like almost every other week right mm -hmm. just to make sure that the everything is aligned and everything is going in the, in the right place and I, I remember they were asking me also what, what what sort of events do you do what how do you choose your date and we just said oh we just asked people what dates they wanted to celebrate and then people came back oh we're gonna do lunar new year we're gonna do this year we're gonna do this we're gonna do that and we just picked the main ones right so they started 
slowly celebrating some of this stuff. But the good thing about the company was they actually came and said, actually, whilst we're doing this, we'd want our clients to come on board with us to know that we're this is the reason why we're doing this and be able. So the insight that they were getting from me and the best practice that I've been able to build and the structure, they were passing that down through their supply chain, which is mm. powerful, right? And 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 for me, it's doing more of that and doing a lot of that and just helping organizations who might be, I don't know, struggling or don't know which direction to turn when it comes to 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 DNI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, this is um one of the first time that you know from someone who works in DI mentioned this, and I also agree with that. It's tapping into the whole ecosystem. That's what I heard from you when it comes to uh, making sure that it goes down even to the supplier level, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and I think it also is one way for, for organizations to help in terms of um, having that equitable practice. Like how do you provide support or how do you even support or like support the small minority owned business lead, uh, business. business owner, right? So. I like that. I like that um, uh, idea. But, Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. yeah. You might not have the big budgets to pay um, for big events and so on and so forth. But there are other ways, there are other innovative ways where they can still do those things with the right support. Uh, but for most of them, it's just giving them the tools and then they can run away. So nothing was prescriptive for me. It was just, okay, these are the tools. And it just went away and said, okay, we're going to take it in this direction. And that's what they did. And it's been brilliant um, since. So, yeah. Hmm. Have you encountered uh, some struggles or obstacles from C-suites that you've spoken with that you notice that there needs to be some correction in terms of the bias? You know, um, all of us have biases, right? But I, I believe too, in terms of the work that we do, we have to mm -hmm. uncover that bias, impact that bias to be able to have a clear understanding of what our role should be and what mm -hmm. how should we can support other people who are experiencing um, challenges in terms of, you know, being um, included or have been, being heard. So in terms of the bias, uh, mm -hmm. how, how often do you find that when, when you speak with leaders? Um, not so much now, to be honest. Um, initially, I get it more externally in society, um, uh, rather than in, in the workplace, uh, one or two instances, but not from C-suite. Uh, and I think because earlier on, C-suite saw what I think, to be honest, once I took on that role back in 2018, I think my second or third interaction People are like, this is the main C-suite person that I was in touch with. I told the other C-suite person that, oh, guess what? This person has come on. We think she's brilliant and, you know, spread the word for me. And really, they were almost like one of the few people who really advocated for me because of that word. Because they basically said, I see you, even when others don't see you. And it was a major boost for me because even in the in the BNI space, you need, I always tell people, you need some protection, you need a shield. Mm -hmm. And that protection for me came from c -Sui. Um, So I've been very lucky, extremely lucky. And I'm told externally more so that I'm extremely lucky in the environment that I am because I have that support, um, mm -hmm. right? But I've heard of stories and other people having those biases. We're humans, right? We'd be biased. And people will always be biased. And sometimes it's the way that people, sometimes it's very subtle. I think most times it's really subtle. But obviously in society, not so much so, right? Mm -hmm. Like people would mistake you for someone else. Or but maybe when I go uh, networking sometimes and people are introducing themselves and I join them and they go, oh, so what do you do? And then I, you know, especially when I was in, you know, when I was really technical and then I say what I did, I was like, almost like shocked that I'm in that role. And, yeah, but, you but you can do the role. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I don't know what it's to be, you know, that kind of thing. But I think it's because we, there's more work for us to do to normalize some of these things mm -hmm. so that people can normalize seeing 
uh, as I say, women of color in certain roles because people are not used to it. So the yes. more we speak out, the more we're seen, the more we're visible. And it's one of the roles I've never set out to be visible. It was it just wasn't me. Mm -hmm. And then someone said, look, you have been a role model for a lot of people. So you need to have your voice. You need to be heard. You need to be out there. And that's why I do the stuff that I do, like speaking opportunities and so on and so forth, right? Um, so that you never know there's a woman out there. Because I get that um, a lot. I get a lot of feedback from a lot of people saying, no, you are the one person that we have that can speak, that has the voice, you carry our voices, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it's, so it's very important not to be there will always be bias because we're always biased right as humans um even on us but for me i'm aware of my privilege so even that so within the organization with the c-suite you know, like having mm -hmm. support of it it's a privilege that's right yeah yeah and, so, and then you're I, using your privilege to be a voice to other people too oh, good. yeah absolutely and to influence certain decisions that we make at a strategic level as well uh so it's been a privilege uh, for me really beautiful beautiful um insights bola um so uh for our listeners who want to make really a positive change in their organizations or even at their own personal lives i know you mentioned some of the uh, insights too based on your experience uh can you share a bit more practical steps or strategies that we can implement to really understand and embrace new cultures that is around us. And again, gain new insights and perspectives by embracing those new cultures. Yeah, uh, and I think I'll do the at a uh, firm level, at an organizational level and at a personal level. I think at the firm level, I think when we're talking about the NI or DEI, we have to ensure that it fits in or it aligns to business priorities. Uh, so what is the business strategy? Is the business strategy uh, globalization? Is it expansion within the UK and so on and so forth? What does that mean? But what does that mean for not just the organization, but its stakeholders, external stakeholders and internal stakeholders, your people and, and so on and so forth? And obviously getting people, stakeholders on board. Uh, so from C-suite all the way through to grassroots in an ideal world would be perfect, right? Uh, but the way, as I've said, that we've been able to navigate that is actually saying, actually, every single person in the organization should have a DNA objective. Because then that puts it in their consciousness that, oh, this is something that I need to play a role in, just as anybody else. So it's a joint thing. Another thing is the articulation. Why are we doing this? Are we just doing it because everyone else is doing it? Are we doing it? Does it align to our purpose? Does it align to our vision? What does it mean um, for us? What should it mean for our people? What do they want it to mean? And um, being able to tie that back and ensure that each time, because you're going to have initiatives and interventions at the back of the data that you're looking at, if the, the data points, the, the stories, they have to make meaning to what you're trying to achieve and the goals that you're trying to give. So that's a, a, a company level. At an individual level, I would say be open-minded. Be open-minded to other cultures. Be, to be honest, I, I am fascinated by culture. I'm fascinated by, fascinated by difference. And I think that's a natural thing for me. So I've only just realized in a few years that not everyone is like that. So. But some people just want to be in their own space, with their own people, and so on and so forth. It's okay, but that's not the way the world, the workplace is, mm -hmm. right? When you go to work, you work with different things, you're working in a diverse team. How would you navigate uh, people? You can talk about the weekend. Have people create a, if you're a line manager, create a forum, small forum, where people can share about what they did openly. Create a psychological space where they feel safe to share whatever it is, no matter how um, old it seems, give them a space to share and, and learn from others. It's not every time that you want to go to the pub, so everything you want to do when someone is leaving, you want to go for alcohol drinks. You could have Muslims within your team that don't, wouldn't want to go to the pub. 
So what's the alternative? You want to have a lunchtime thing um, and just go for lunch. And then people who want to go for drinks in the evening can go for drinks. Um, so that, that way you're being inclusive, right? There's a lot of talk around managing diverse teams. And I think these are some of the pointers that people can do within the team. Apart from being open-minded, you can, you know, being open-minded, you can actually read books, recommended books, films, and so on and so forth. I know someone who is of South Asian heritage. And I remember when we had a Let's Talk About Race event during the George Floyd thing. It was a candid conversation. People talked about race in the workplace, in society, and meaningful actions that we can take. And we shared resources. People will come back to me today and go, you know that film that you recommended on Netflix or someone or some book that someone recommended? This is what it means to me. This is what it means to my daughter. I read it with my daughter. I read it with my son. Some allies were recommending books for us. Right. That's allies as well. Mm -hmm. So as an ally, what more can you do as a leader? How are you changing the organization? How are you impacting ordinary lives within the organization? What's your purpose? What, what uh, you mentioned legacy earlier, what legacy would you want to leave when you leave this world or when you leave the company? What does that look like? And there's so many ways that we can do this. Uh, we know representation is a problem. If you're on a board, or in the room that you're in when you're making strategic decisions, just look around for a minute. Do you have the representation? The representation, not just in terms of skin color, to be honest, mm -hmm. diverse thoughts, oh, cognitive yeah. mm -hmm. Is it there? Are you being challenged? Or is everyone saying, yeah, we go with that? Mm -hmm. When everyone is saying that, you should be going, uh, yeah, I'm a bit worried because you're mm -hmm. all like, really, you know, and that kind of a thing. And um, yeah, there's a lot around that and just giving people the sense of belonging as, as an organization. Celebrate different things that people, I mean, we do Burns Night where we do whiskey tasting, we get a piper in and we do it properly, we taste haggis. And these are people who have never, you'd have people there that never tasted food from other cultures, never, ever. And for the first time, they're trying haggis or jello fries or, you know, dumplings or, you know, or something else. That's what it means, you know, to be integrated, to, 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 to encourage uh, mm -hmm. multiculturalism. And hopefully you start seeing it in performance, improved performance um, going forward for the company, not just for the company, but for society, because mm -hmm. you're contributing to society. Because when those colleagues, when they go back home, what are they going to be talking about? <laughs> that event, that thing, that thing that they ate, that was nice, that was different. That's what they're going to be talking about. And or the story they that they heard, right? From a colleague absolutely. who's very unique, yeah, different. Yeah. Absolutely. And their families will be doing the same thing. And then the next thing, they'll be booking to go to restaurants that they've never been to before and trying foods they've never tried before. And that's how... You know, this multiculturalism, you start to see the positive impact through society because it reduces bias mm -hmm. ultimately. Because all of a sudden you're looking at people and you're not looking through the stereotypical lens. You're looking at them for, the, for who they are, through their culture, through their behaviors, through their values and, 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 and other things as well. Yeah. Great, great. So just one last question um, before I wrap up. And I know uh, maybe I didn't mention this to you, but because you mentioned something about organization aligning with their business strategy, business goals, right? Uh, I have encountered some questions from leaders who are kind of like not really sure uh, the relationship of sustainability and DEI. And so I had to explain to them why you should integrate DEI and sustainability in your business strategy. But what are your thoughts on that? Why should they incorporate DEI and sustainability in their business strategy? What's the relation? Uh, <laughs> it's a very good question. And it's something that I've been um, I've, I've been working on myself um, over a few years because I, I work for LGM. LGM is big on ESG, as you know. Um, we've got a separate function. It looks at responsibly investing. Um, we've got a stewardship th uh, team, we've got active ownership where we actually hold other companies accountable on board diversity, for instance. So that's mm -hmm. that's one way. So we do it through that. 
So that's how that's how we hold ourselves to account. So we're going out to people and going, okay, this is part of our purpose. We want to create um, a purpose through responsible investing for our people. What does that mean for us? So we need we need to be actionable. We need to be taking action in in in, in things. We look at climate and and so on and so forth as well, and the race to net zero and and so on and so forth. But in terms of DEI specifically. I would say is that S of ESG because mm. that's the social bit, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's mm-hmm. where DNI and DNI sits in perfectly in that. So when you're doing DNI, you're not doing it as a separate thing on the side. You're actually integrating it into your business strategy, whatever that business strategy. Right. So if the company is already thinking of talking about sustainability, for instance, what is sustainability? It's actually living the world in a way where future generations it won't be depleting, we won't deplete resources for future generations, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That is what DEI is doing. The stuff that I'm doing in trying to ensure that our workplace is inclusive enough so that future generation, future graduates coming in, we find the conducive and we stay till they make it to, it work, to the top. Yeah. Right, exactly. So you're sustaining, mm-hmm. looking at the systemic or structural barriers along the way and working with others to remove those, right? So that that can happen organically. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a way that companies can do that. And there's a very strong link between the social, the S and the DNI stuff that we do, mm-hmm. right? Because you're not just doing it for, it's not like a, a ethnic minority type thing, it's a disability, it's a marginalized groups, right? right. How are you giving them a voice? How are you giving them a sense of belonging? And by doing that, it's a social purpose. It's like, this is who we are as a brand. That's what it's saying. That's a story that it's telling. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of research out there that it actually leads to having diverse teams and diverse groups and cognitive diversity within the organization. Companies that actually have that, they grow faster and they, uh, they're more profitable as well. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of research behind it. So there's no reason why you can't do it. And if companies are going, oh, actually, we can do a lot of stuff, charitable stuff externally, that's part of DAI, right? Because when you're investing, if you're investing in, for example, an area of London, um, but while you're investing in that area, you're actually putting money into that area mm-hmm. for initiatives, right? Mm-hmm. That means mm-hmm. you're doing something of social value, right? Because yeah. you're giving back um to that value so there's so many ways that you can do this and get your people um your employees involved as well to actually drive some of those initiatives right right perfect very good thank you thank you for sharing your thoughts on that one and so you know I, i'd like us to continue but i know um bala has to go uh, i just book her for you know a 30 minute it, it's over 30 minutes already i really appreciate your time bala and so just to you know summarize what i heard from you uh, one of the key driver is really the C-suite when it comes to um, transforming the the, the workplace, uh, moving the needle forward to your DEI work. C-suite uh, buy-in support is very important. Engaging uh, your grassroots, giving your ERGs budget, that's very important. <laughs> uh, and it's really, uh, you know, sometimes one of the things that I I encounter is you know, we want to support our ERGs, but we don't have a budget. So I ask them again, how do you, how can you support them, right? So you need to empower these groups to be able to do their work. So really? that's one of the things I heard from you. Um, also, the importance of creating that safe space to encourage uh, courageous conversations within the team and within the uh, organization. Also, uh, ensuring that, you know, supporting people from underrepresented groups, you are helping them to become role models as well. Uh, for people to be encouraged and to be uh, motivated to really know that whatever this person has achieved, I can achieve too, regardless of my skin color, regardless of my uh, current situation in life. That's why I heard from you. Um, and uh, lastly, again, your thoughts on sustainability and its relation to DEI. Well, thanks so much, Bola. Um, it's really a pressure, pleasure learning from you, uh, having this time with you. So can you tell us uh, when is your next... What's next for you? So I, I know that you'll be speaking next, but where can they find you, Bola? <laughs> I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. 
I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Bola, I just see not MBA. Um, yeah, so feel free to connect. I'm happy to uh, share best practice, to uh, speak at events. Uh, as I was telling you, I was at an event yesterday um, talking about DEI and uh, sustainability and AI, um, especially. Uh, but when I talk about AI and, and tech and the future of work, I talk about it from a good perspective. Uh, from a, a human side of things. Um, yes, so no, I'm happy. Um, I, I have been speaking, I'm speaking at UCX uh, Europe in October um, as well on similar themes as well. So if anyone uh, will be at the event uh, at the Excel in London, um, come and say hi. Uh, yes, um, I, I, I do some stuff on, I put some stuff on Instagram as well. Um, and on Twitter, uh, but mostly um, on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. All right. Thank you. So yes, please connect with Bala Adesina MBA on LinkedIn, uh, and then you'll get all of these wonderful insights. Uh, she's very helpful. She's very supportive uh, in terms of DEI. Um, I encourage you to connect with her. Uh, okay. So thanks so much, Bala. Uh, we appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone, for um, staying with us throughout this uh, interview with Bala. And I know you have picked up a lot of very good insights that you can implement right away in your workplace. Thanks, everyone, and see you again next time. This is Maria Dreco with inclusionjourney.com.